Uh, so we've heard actually in the previous talk already Xenia mentioning a uh, denoising diffusion model. So this is the topic of this, uh, this lecture today. Uh, so um, at first I would like to acknowledge, uh, thanks my former postdoc in Oxford, uh, Valentin de Bortoli, because I borrowed some of his slides. So thank, uh, thanks to him. Um, basically, uh, denoising diffusion model is a topic that's completely exploded over the past two, three years. So I will just basically cover some of the basics, but hopefully, uh, basically, uh, you'll understand at least the main principle behind denoising diffusion model and also some of the most uh, recent research question we, we are looking at. Okay, so I'm not going to repeat basically what's the task of generative modeling. So denoising the, the diffusion model is a class essentially of uh, deep generative models. Why we care about the generative modeling? Well, it has already been motivated by Xenia, so I'm not going to repeat that. But basically, essentially, you're given some kind of data sample, could be image, sounds, proteins, uh, something like that, you know, anything you can think of. Uh, so you have access to some kind of uh, data sample, and you want to have basically from some unknown distribution pi, and you want to come up with a model that's going to generate sample approximately distributed according to pi. That, that's pretty much it. So it's not a very rigorous definition, but that's pretty much what we want to do, okay? So <laughs> it has numerous applications. Uh, personally, I've been working recently in particular on protein generation, okay. but there are many, many of us. So generative model is a really hot topic in, in machine learning. Uh, basically now it's been going on for at least a good uh, 15 years, maybe 10 years. So they are like, you are the kind of main class of model you can, you might have heard of. So this thing doesn't work, sorry. Uh, sorry. Ah. <laughs> the pointer doesn't, uh, sorry about that. I'm trying, there's no light, I think. Uh, okay, it works, okay, sorry. Sorry about that. So, there are many different class of generative model. So Xenia mentioned variational autoencoders on basically generative adversarial network, which are actually extremely popular. You can think also of energy-based model or normalizing flow. But today, as you say, we're gonna focus on denoising diffusion model. So denoising diffusion model were actually introduced in 2015 in a paper by uh, Saul Dickstein, who used to work at uh, Google Brain, which is now part of Google DeepMind. On the paper, when it was published, he didn't attract much attention because basically there were kind of few components missing to make those methods scale. But somehow it was kind of rediscovered independently by two research groups. One group is the group of uh, Stefano Herman with Yang Song in, in, uh, in Stanford. On another group is the group of Peter Abil. On the paper was basically written with uh, Jonathan O in Berkeley. So they, they wrote two kind of influential papers in this area. It was like, 2020, 2021. And um, basically, this is at the time where I started to get interested in, in this, this domain. Okay. So, ever since, as I said, uh, the field has completely exploded. Uh, and I think there's over like already three or 4,000 publications on the subject. And um, so, if you're interested in uh, trying to uh, actually keep track of the literature, some of my uh, former uh, PhD and postdoc have a website where basically they list some of the papers by topics so we might be interested in. So why those methods became very interesting, very popular? Well, first, because they provide state-of-the-art results on many, many tasks like image generation. So for example, there was this 21, 2021 paper by Dariwal and Nicole from basically OpenAI, where basically the title of the talk is Diffusion Bit Scan at Image Generation. Okay, they provide actually really high-dimensional, high-resolution, images with better FID score than what was achieved before by GAN. Okay. And ever since, basically, these models have been applied to a plethora of domain like music generation, speed generation, um, in pretty much all domains that actually outperform competitors. Okay. So there is an, there's an exception or an important exception to, the, to, this, to, to this thing is that actually they are not that great at text generation. So this is a kind of, a, if you're interested in, a, in denoising diffusion model and you want to actually work on something influential, if you manage to basically develop denoising diffusion model, which works as 
as good as basically as like the kind of autoregulative transformers, this is what you should be doing. It'd be amazing. There's a gap here. Okay, so they are very flexible as well. As we'll see, you know, you can really do a lot of things. You can compose them. You can do easily conditional, conditional simulation and so on and so forth. So it's actually very practical compared to, uh, to uh, our techniques. And finally as well, they kind of like, they can be also analyzed theoretically. So in a sense, they have a very nice mathematical structure that make them amenable to pretty sophisticated theoretical analysis. Even if those theoretical analyses yet do not explain why those methods appear to work empirically extremely well, okay? Okay. So some example of, you know, application to, of denoising diffusion model, where denoising diffusion model are at the core of a lot of like basically generative AI application you've heard of. So ImageGen that was developed by, by Google, Daily2 by OpenAI, Stable Diffusion, Midjourney, all basically those basic, those, uh, those software rely on denoising diffusion model and they are able to generate extremely high quality images. Okay, so what I will first start doing is explaining at a very high level what denoising diffusion model do, what, how they proceed, and then we will basically dive into the mathematics of denoising diffusion model. Okay, so I, to illustrate the noising, uh, the, the, the noising diffusion model, I've basically uh, taken this video from Yang Song paper from iClear 2021. So the basic idea is the following. So you're given a set of data. So say, think of it for, for, the, for, the, for the purpose of this talk, I just think of, of those data as being images, okay? So you get access to those data, and this is based on this empirical data that you want to build a generative model. And the thing you're gonna do is that basically you're gonna take your data and you're gonna corrupt them progressively by noise. Okay, so that's the kind of idea. You have your screen data that are given to you and basically you're gonna corrupt them by noise so that basically after having run, it, run this corruption process long enough, essentially you have, you have a Gaussian noise sample. Okay, so that's the kind of idea. So you know it progressively your data. So <laughs> as illustrated here on the right side, so assume, so this is for the purpose of illustration, assume the distribution of the data is bimodal, okay? And you basically know it progressively sample from this bimodal distribution, then eventually you transform your original bimodal image distribution into a Gaussian distribution, okay? So this is here, some illustration of bimodal distribution on as time proceeds, this thing is Gaussianized on the marginal distribution of the sample you obtain is Gaussian. Okay, so it's very simple. This thing is a trivial thing to do. I give you image, you add noise progressively at the distributional level, you transform the data distribution into a Gaussian distribution. Uh, what generative modeling is, is really you can think of it as doing the reverse thing. So you're gonna basically start from Gaussian noise sample and denoise them progressively so that as to obtain sample from the data distribution. Okay, so this is illustrated here. So at the sample level, you start from basically some Gaussian noise sample and you're gonna denoise them progressively and I'm gonna explain you how we're doing that later on. And basically you do that long enough and eventually you're gonna obtain some essentially new data sample. At the distributional level is really, you, you have your Gaussian distribution and you have a basically a denoising diffusion process that, that transforms this original like Gaussian distribution into the data distribution. So that's the idea. Okay, so that's really a high level, but are we doing that mathematically? Okay, so gonna illustration or what does it mean mathematically? Or I'm gonna basically implement this corruption uh, mechanism, this noisy mechanism, okay? Now, the noisy mechanism is gonna be the trivial bit. Okay, so at the sample level, it tells you, okay, you take a data sample X naught, you have access to some, some data sample, so you take a data sample X naught, 
and you're going to basically run the following formal recursion. Okay, so you're going to say x1, this is the first corrupted version of x0, is going to be equal to root 1 minus beta x0 plus root beta times some Gaussian noise sample epsilon 1. Okay, and beta is big very close to zero. Okay, so basically what you're doing, you multiply the original image by a little factor, a little bit below one, and you add noise, Gaussian noise. And then you keep on repeating this. So this is what achieved here. This is your realization of this process. So you have x dot, x1, x2, and so on, etc. And you do that till basically time k. Um, for anyone who studied time series or has done some kind of electrical engineering, you know that if you iterate this process, this is a autoregressive process of order one, then basically for k large enough, capital K large enough, you're going to have a sample which is approximately Gaussian. Okay, so you completely forget, essentially, you forget exponentially the essentially the initial condition x naught, or literally, basically, it's going to take you to a sample x capital K, which is roughly actually a Gaussian noise sample. Okay, so that's basically the noisy mechanism. On what does it mean at the distributional level? Well, at the distributional level, well, you define a Markov process, okay, a Markov chain in discrete time, whose initial distribution is the data distribution. And then basically, you apply a sequence of Markov transition kernel, okay, that transforms xk into xk plus one. And this Markov transition kernel is simply a normal distribution of argument xk plus one mean root one minus beta xk on variance beta time identity. Okay, so that, that's basically what happened as the distribution loop. Okay, so one thing we will use actually uh, repeatedly during this talk is that the noisy mechanism is extremely simple, okay, because it's just a simple, you see, given by simple linear equation on, on you had some Gaussian noise. So that basically, if you want to obtain xk given x0, okay, you don't need to sample x1, x2, x3, x4, and so on. You can jump directly from x0 to xk by basically sampling from this Gaussian distribution here. So we have an explicit expression for that takes us from x0 to xk, and this is simply because you can combine all the simple linear Gaussian transformation together so as to basically jump directly from time zero to time k. So this is illustrated here by this arrow here, okay? Um, so we have, exp at, at, we have access to this transition, and um, this transition is really gonna be useful for the maths that we're gonna develop later on. And this transition also illustrates, you see, that basically as k is large enough, then basically the distribution of my sample is Gaussian because you can see here clearly that as k goes to this, this uh, time index uh, k increases, this parameter alpha k goes to zero. So the mean basically is approximately zero on the variance is approximately the identity. Okay, so that's, that's a uh, nice thing. Okay, so that's basically noising. Also noising is trivial. What about denoising, which is what we want to do. So what we want to do, Remember, is really the reverse thing. I want to start from basically the noise, which is Gaussian noise, approximately Gaussian. And um, basically, I want to denoise progressively sample so as to obtain at time zero a sample approximately distributed according to the data distribution. Okay. So what we're going to do is simple. We're going to rely on something which is known as ancestral sampling. So remember here what I had. What I had here is basically the joint distribution of the clear, basically, sample on the progressively corrupted version of this clean sample. Okay, so this is joint distribution, Q, X0, X1, XK. And I had performed here a forward decomposition of this joint distribution. But obviously, what I can do, I can also press the wrong button again. No, okay. 
I can also perform a backward decomposition of this disjoint distribution. So basically, I write here, I just say basically disjoint distribution by a backward decomposition is given by, to, by the marginal distribution of X capital K under the forward, basically, noising mechanism time the product of backward Markov transition kernel that take me, me from xk plus one to xk. Okay? So that's basically a formula that is always valid. Okay? And basically what it tells you that if you wanted to obtain sample from the marginal, from, the, from, the, from x naught, okay, what you could do is sampling xk from its marginal distribution qk, and then sample xk given xk plus one according to this Markov backward transition kernel, and recurs backward like that till time zero, and you would obtain at time zero, by definition, a sample from the data distribution. So that's the key thing. It's ancestral sampling. That's, that's what we're going to try to do. OK, so that's what we want to achieve. Uh, well, we have two problems. So in practice, when you want to implement this, well, what do you need? Well, you need to have access to the marginal distribution of xk under the forward noising mechanism. But this thing is not difficult because I, de I designed the noising mechanism such that x capital k is roughly Gaussian. So this thing is roughly a Gaussian distribution. So that's not really the complicated bit. I can replace the by simulating from a Gaussian. But then I'm going to have to sample from this backward Markov transition kernel, which are essentially what's going to implement the denoising mechanism. OK, so what is this thing? So let's write the expression of this backward Markov transition density. Well, what I'm doing simply is I'm applying base rule. So I'm saying q of xk given xk plus 1 is q of xk plus 1 given xk time basically the marginal distribution of xk over the marginal distribution of xk plus 1, where here this marginal distribution corresponds to the marginal distribution of those variables under the forward, actually, noising corruption mechanism. Okay? So literally, what we need to do, if we could sample from this backward Markov transition uh, kernel will be done, okay? Because then we use ancestral sampling, and at time zero, we would obtain sample from the data distribution. OK, the problem is that those things are intractable. Okay. Those Markov, like those actually marginal, uh, marginal distribution, they are actually not, not uh, uh, available analytically. So we're going to have to make approximation. So in practice, well, the, the, the work we're going to have to do is to come up with a way to approximate this Markov, Markov, backward Markov transition kernel and we're going to approximate that by some kind of transition kernel, p theta. OK? So that, that's going to be the, essentially the, the main, main thing we have to do, so as to actually mimic, come up with an approximation of ancestral sampling. OK, so how are we doing this? Oh, this is very simple. So let's basically look at this equation of this backward Mark Markov transition density, where, OK, so this is a density of argument, probability density function of argument xk, whose parameter depend on xk plus one. Okay. So in particular, it's proportional to this expression. Okay, I can drop here, I can drop the numerator, which is independent of xk. XK plus, okay, so I drop that. So this is proportional to this expression. And now we're gonna basically make further approximation. So the first thing we're going to say is that, well, you know what? Because beta is very close to zero, it means that basically the difference between the marginal distribution QK and the marginal distribution QK plus one is very small. So I'm going to make the approximation QK equal QK plus one. OK. So basically, it gives me that essentially the backward Markov transition kernel is approximately proportional to the forward transition kernel to exponential log uk plus one xk. And the second thing we're going to make 
is we're going to make a Taylor expansion of this log QK plus one. So basically, I'm going to say I'm going to approximate this log QK plus one of XK by a Taylor approximation that is computed at XK plus one. Okay, so I make my little Taylor approximation, and this is what I obtain. Okay, and once more, this thing makes sense because XK on XK plus one, because the noise I introduce, okay, which is a variance, root data is very small, where I expect XK minus XK plus one to be very small, so that this Taylor approximation is a good approximation. So it's a first order Taylor approximation, but it's going to be a good approximation for, for my purpose. Okay, so this is it. So I made the, this approximation. And now basically what I do, I recombine the forward transition kernel, which is kind of linear Gaussian transition kernel, very simple, autoregressive Gaussian kernel, with my basically my approximation of exponential log QK. And by combining the two terms, what I obtain, I obtain the finally the following expression for the backward Markov transition kernel. OK, so this is an approximation of backward Markov transition kernel. OK, we see this is a Gaussian distribution of argument XK. And it has a mean here, which is given by this expression, okay, which depends on this term. I will come back to that. And it has a variance beta time identity, which is hidden by this little window. I apologize. <laughs> OK. So we've made progress. We have an, we have an approximation of backward Markov transition kernel is kind of like fairly more friendly than basically having access to this expression. But we're not quite done, because obviously, we don't have access to this thing. So what is this thing? This thing is something that's known as the Stein score, or score in the literature. So this is the gradient with respect to x, okay, of log of the marginal density uh, qk plus one. Okay, so we need to come up now with approximation of this intractable term. So I told you those marginal distribution they are not analytically available. So obviously the gradient of log of this marginal density are not available either. Okay, so I'm going to approximate that. Well, this is the topic of the next slide. So the thing is going to rely on a key identity that was proposed in the literature, actually, maybe in the 50s, which is known as 2D identity. OK. So remember that what we need to do now, we made a lot of progress in our approximation of those backward Markov transition density, but they rely on this kind of intractable score term, which is the gradient of the log of the intractable marginal density. OK. So what I'm telling you is that you can prove that this score is essentially the expectation of the gradient of the log condition from x naught to xk, which is a term which is known analytically because I've used transition, which are simple linear Gaussian. I told you, you can write in explicit form the transition that takes you from x naught to xk. So you can compute this term here, the gradient of the log of this condition for x0 to xk, analytically. And basically, you take the conditional expectation of, of that with respect to xk. OK? So if I had written it as an integral, it would be integral of this term with respect to the conditional distribution of x0 given xk under this kind of forward noisy mechanism. OK? So plugging in the expression of the gradient of the log condition, you can see here that this, this can be written as follow here. So we see that we have a term that appears. This is the conditional expectation of x naught of xk, which you can think of is a, as a denoiser. This is your best approximation of x naught in the mean square sense, given the noisy version uh, of x naught given by xk. Okay. So this is called. OK. So. Maybe we can have a brief look at how you establish this type of formula because it's actually quite simple. And this kind of calculation appears repeatedly when you work with, with denoising diffusion model. So maybe I'll go for it very quickly. OK, so how do you prove this type of identity? Well, we're going to prove it as follows. So what is the marginal distribution, QK, the intractable marginal density QK I want to take the gradient of the log of? where is given by the original data distribution, Q0, 
to which you apply the Markov transition kernel that take you from X naught to X k. Okay, so this is by definition, this is by definition of basically my uh, noisy mechanism on in the literature sometimes is known as some kind of Chapman polymorphic equation. Okay, so you have access to this expression. Um, now what we're going to do, I want to compute the gradient of the log of this, this distribution. Well, I'm going to use the log derivative, derivative trick, which is the gradient of log QK is gradient of QK over QK. Okay. So the one over QK, I leave it in front. Okay, here. Oh, now, what is the gradient of Q of XK? Well, I take the gradient of this integral with respect to XK. So I move the gradient within the integral, and this is the expression I obtain. Okay, so I hear this really elementary, uh, actually, algebraic manipulation. Okay, so now what I do, I've got the gradient of the log transition. And I apply the log derivative trick, but in the reverse direction. I tell you that this gradient is basically the gradient of the log of this transition times this transition. Okay? So I put all the terms together. I bridge all the I, I, gr I group all the terms together. Okay, so this I've got this expression that appears here. And here, what do we have appearing? We have basically q naught x naught time, basically. The Markov transition that takes me from X0 to XK divided the marginal distribution of XK under this forward mechanism. But this thing is nothing by base rule that the posterior distribution of X0 given XK under the noisy mechanism. So, what I've established indeed that the gradient of log of QK XK, the gradient of my, my intractable score, is given by the conditional expectation of basically this tractable quantity. So this is respect to this conditional distribution, Q of X not given X. Okay. And if I plug the expression I have for the gradient of the log condition, I plug it in on, here we go. I've got the expression I have written here as well, which shows that estimating the score of the distribution is implicitly, when you do that, you also implicitly estimate a denoiser. Okay. Okay, so we made progress, but we are not quite yet done. Okay, because what we have to do, this thing is given by a conditional expectation of basically conditional distribution of X not given XK, but I don't have access to that. I don't have access to the, to the, to the expression of this conditional distribution. So I need to do yet, I, did, I need to do something more. So what am I gonna do? Well, I'm gonna remember what basically a conditional expectation is, okay. So when you do your first course of uh, statistics or probability, uh, you've learned the following thing. Okay, so assume I give you two random variables, u, u on x, okay? And you were interested in computing basically the conditional expectation of x given u. So the conditional expectation of x given u is only a function of u, okay? Or let me call it f of u. Okay. So I just say, well, the conditional expectation of x given u is a function of u. Okay. And um, what is this function f? Well, we know that this function f is the function that minimizes the expectation of the square norm between x and f u among all measurable functions f. Okay. So Basically, that's a characterization of conditional expectation. Good. So why is it useful to me? So remember that in my scenario, really what I'm interested in, in I'm interested in computing this conditional expectation. So this intractable score is given by a conditional expectation here. Okay. So using the previous characterization of basically conditional expectation, I can think that the intractable score is basically given by the function, the measurable function of X, the function of X, which minimize the expectation of the square norm between F and the gradient of the log condition. So that's basically a simple characterization of this conditional expectation. So here, 
what you see is that for a given f, where you can estimate this loss unbiasedly, because the expectation here is respect to the joint distribution of x naught on xk, but uh, you can sample from the joint distribution of x naught on xk. You just pick a sample in the database, you obtain x naught, and then you add noise using your transition kernel that takes you from x naught to xk. So you can basically sample, you can easily sample from this, this, uh, this, uh, this distribution, so you can obtain unbiased estimate of this loss function. Okay. So that's nice. But obviously, practically, you, you cannot basically look at all, you cannot model all possible measurable function. It's impossible, obviously, because there's infinite dimensional space. So what we're going to do, we're going to say, well, okay, I cannot like look at all the possible functions, so I'm going to restrict myself simply to a function, a very flexible class of function, parameterized basically by neural network. And so what I'm going to say, I'm going to basically restrict myself to function which are basically given by a neural network. And because also I need to estimate the score not only at time one, but at time two, three, four times till capital K, then I'm going to basically consider simply a function that had, had needs two input, time and space. Okay. And I want this function to approximate the score at basically for input X on uh, K on X, I want it to approximate the, the score grad log Q K X. Okay. And what I do is I simply sum over K all these possible loss function. Sorry all these possible loss function so as to optimize to ob obtain the following loss here. Right, so that's really the idea of, of really what's going on. So we did an approximation of the backward Markov, Markov transition kernel. To this backward Markov transition kernel, basically our approximation uh, includes an intractable score. This intractable score basically is a conditional expectation. Because it's a conditional expectation, we can reformulate that as a regression problem. Okay. Um, essentially, because we want also to estimate the score not only at a given time index k, but at all the intermediate time one to capital K, we combine all the regression loss together and we obtain the following loss. Okay. So that's very nice because this thing. It can easily be minimized in theta using stochastic gradient. So you can basically subsample over the time index indices. You don't have to do all the sum from one to capital K, which is good because capital K in some application can be of order of 100. But you can basically simply subsample a few values of K. And basically, you can sample actually sample from X out on XK directly. You don't have to enroll all the, the corruption mechanism so as to a sample to so have to obtain sample uh, basically. So that's nice. And you can obtain obviously unbiased gradient of this loss. And so it's very simple. So compare in particular to GAN, we see that we don't have adversarial you know optimization problem. We don't have this kind of min-max problem to solve. Here it's a very standard regression loss. That that's all it is. So this, that's why in a sense it's quite much more stable to train than algorithms such as GAN. Actually, okay, so that's nice. Um, but if you look at the literature, often the loss you're gonna you're gonna see in the papers is actually quite a bit different from what is presented here. Okay, so why is it the case? So let's look at basically what's going on here. So essentially, the score s theta k. Okay, so if you look at basically, you fix the time index k. You see that what you try to estimate at the time, it approximates the score at time k. Now, the problem you see is that when k is large, qk is roughly Gaussian. It's a really, really roughly Gaussian. So the score where is the gradient of the uh, gradient of log of a Gaussian, it's linear. It's a linear function of x. Okay, very simple. But the problem is when you get close to the data distribution. Well, you just have a finite number of data. So the score basically is very picky. So it turns out that the value S theta can take pretty, pretty large value, actually. So it's not quite nice because you see, you want a neural net 
which essentially for k large enough approximate a linear function, essentially. But when you're close to, uh, to, uh, to the data distribution, that is k is small, well, the score you're trying to approximate is a very, very picky function, OK? So your, your neural net is approximating function which are on the different scale dependent, dependent on k. So that's not quite nice. So how can we fix this problem? Well, you can do the following thing. OK. So remember, again, that the key thing about denoising diffusion model is you can basically directly generate xk, the corrupted version xk of x0 without simulating all the intermediate sample x1, x2, xk minus 1. OK? So remember that basically, essentially, when you, how you would implement the transition kernel q of xk given x0 on your computer, well, you would do it as follows. You would say xk is square, uh, square root alpha k x0 plus 1 square root 1 minus alpha k epsilon, where epsilon is a Gaussian noise sample. OK. So that's basically what you implement on your computer when you generate xk given x0. OK. Now, if you plug that in the expression of the score of the transition, the gradient of the log of transition, where well, you see that basically you obtain an expression which is given by minus epsilon of uh, root 1 minus alpha k. OK? OK. So what did it tell you, this thing? Well, it tells you that really, when you try to estimate the score, which is given, remember, by the conditional expectation of this quantity, OK? Of respect to the conditional distribution of x0 given xk, well, instead of doing the parametrization we've been using before, what about parametrizing essentially the score estimate as follow? Essentially to follow the same somehow the same parametrization as essentially the gradient of the log transition. It's kind of a good idea, you see, because when you're gonna do that, you expect that the function epsilon theta here that you would estimate at your numerator is scale is not gonna vary across the time index indices. Okay, somehow this thing is always gonna be a quantity of order one. It's not gonna blow up close to zero, okay, which is really good because most likely it, it, it facilitates the training of, of your neural network. Okay, so this is really what people have been doing. Um, essentially, if you use this, this type of parametrization where you're not essentially estimating directly the score, where you're estimating the noise that was used to generate the sample xk given x0, then you obtain with a loss, where actually it's a bit annoying here, <laughs> it's a loss which is very similar to this loss. Huh? I've just basically substituted the expression of the score, basically on pick a very specific value of, yeah. yeah. So you obtain the following simple loss here. Okay, so it's a very, very simple expression where essentially you see you are basically now just estimating quantity which are always of the same orders of magnitude, whatever being k. Okay, so this is known this thing as a simple loss in the paper of O on this widely used in the literature. Okay, so that's nice. So really, in a sense, once you're equipped with that, you're kind of done. So you have your training loss to train your score your intractable score. So you use either the direct parametrization of the score or you use this kind of noise parametrization of the score, but you have a very simple loss you can minimize using your favorite SGD Adam type algorithm. Okay, so once you've done that, you have an estimate of the intractable score that, was, that we are basically bothering you to start with. So now we are done essentially when we've done that. So when you minimize this loss, you have basically trained a neural net to learn the score. Um, basically, you, you can now basically implement your an approximation to ancestral sampling. So remember what we were having at the beginning. So I wanted to do ancestral sampling. So I wanted to sample from this joint distribution of the corrupted process, but in a backward direction. The marginal at time k is roughly Gaussian by construction on no. This backward Markov transition density, I know that I can approximate them for this expression. 
essentially. So this is here the kind of expression which is obtained by using the Taylor approximation of the true backward Markov transition density on substituting to the intractable score my neural net approximation. Okay. So now, practically, what it means is that you sample a Gaussian sample X capital K on your recurse backward using this little equation here, which corresponds to sampling for the macro, backward Markov transition density. On at time zero, you have a Gaussian noise. You have a, a, a sample approximately distributed according to the data distribution. So in practice, there's a lot of trick to make that work. Okay? I'm not going to say it works like that off the shelf. So in particular, uh, I haven't discussed that really, but it's a very to improve the stability of the training. Uh, when I say it's, it's not unstable, it's actually a bit unstable. So typically, people use some kind of exponential moving average so as to improve actually the robustness of the training of, of, the, of the score network. But basically, uh, it's, uh, it says, I would say, second order issues. Uh, now we're focusing in this lecture on the kind of main principle behind, uh, behind a denoising diffusion model. Okay, so that's the algorithm. All right, so now for people, uh, for those of you who are uh, basically uh, quite familiar with VAE, we see that it kind of looks like a VAE actually. Uh, this type of uh, this type of architecture is actually quite quite closely related, and this is what we're going to show here actually. So we see that it is possible to come up with the algorithm I've discussed. <coughs> previously, by simply following some kind of variational perspective, which is very, very similar to what Xenia has presented for VA. Okay. So that was actually first proposed uh, by, in the original paper by Sol, of Sol Dickstein in 2015. And this is the approach that is also uh, favored. Uh, this is the way those models are introduced in the paper by Jonathan Poe. Okay. So an advantage of this variational approach over the kind of approach I proposed previously is that essentially it's gonna, you're going to come up with a, 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 an optimization criteria, it's a criteria that's going to be an elbow. And because it's an elbow, basically you can, it can help you tuning, say, some hyperparameter uh, of, the, of, the, of the algorithm. So there's a lot of things you could do. Uh, in particular, uh, what I've been presenting, presented in, the, in this uh, lecture is that typically the amount of noise you, 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 uh, you add at each time step is not constant, but typically you make it time dependent and you spend more time basically close to the, to the, uh, to the original data, data point on when basically you're far away, you can add more noise. Okay. Okay, so let's go for that. Okay, so think about what we are doing. So what we are doing when we have this kind of denoising diffusion model, well, we have a probabilistic model where we start from some Gaussian noise sample xk, and then you recurse backward with your backward, your the learned backward Markov transition kernel till time zero. Okay, so this is literally what we are doing. On what we are concerned, what we are interested in, is basically the sample at time zero. Okay, that are obtained by this generative model, which is obviously the, their distribution is given by the integral of this really high dimensional distribution over all these intermediate latent variable, variables, sorry, x1, x2, xk. Okay, so it looks very similar to basically what you're doing in a VAE, where basically, except that here you see what plays the role of Z in the, 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 the slide of Xenia here is replaced by X1, X2, X capital K. A major difference as well with what Xenia has presented is that a VA context, Z is typically of a much lower dimension than X0, but in our case, it's of the same dimension. Okay? But so that's a kind of actually major difference, but, but this is. Okay. So, but really, irrespective of that, what we see is that the model we have designed is a model, basically, which is somehow intractable on the marginal density of the sample we generate 
is given by this high dimensional integral. Okay. Now, if I wanted to learn essentially the parameter of this module, so instead of doing what, I, what, what I've been doing previously, imagine that now I just basically, you have a parameterized basically sequence of backward Markov transition density, and you want to learn the parameters of this backward Markov transition density, okay? So you don't know anything about diffusion model. Well, well, you would say, well, one thing I could try to do, it's not always optimal, but is to try to essentially maximize the log likelihood of, for this model, okay? So you basically, you have data which are available distributed according to Q0, this is my data distribution, and you want to really learn the parameters of your generative model by maximizing essentially the log, the log of the uh, marginal, uh, marginal density of X0. Okay, that's the obvious thing one would do. Okay, so you'd like to do that, but it's obviously impossible, and it's impossible because simply I don't have access to the marginal likelihood here because it requires integrated of X1, X2, XK. So it's like in in uh, GAN, in sorry, in VA, you know, you you don't know how to integrate basically Z analytically. So instead of maximizing uh, a likelihood, what you typically do is you introduce an evidence law bound, and then you maximize this evidence law bound. And here you can do exactly the same. That's what I'm saying. Okay. So what we're we gonna do is something very similar to what people are doing in VA. So you write basically the log of the intractable marginal density of X0 under your generative model. And you say, well, I can rewrite this marginal density. Well, it's simple. You can rewrite it at the expectation of this ratio over the basically a conditional distribution of X1, a, a conditional distribution Q, which corresponds to the literally noisy mechanism I've introduced previously. Okay, so. This thing in the VA, it was an encoder whose parameter were learned. In our case, it's fixed. Okay, I'm just saying, basically, I'm not learning any encoder. I have basically a mechanism at the X naught and then generate X1, X2, XK using this kind of noising mechanism. And this is this thing here. So this identity is always true. Okay, there's nothing. I could have picked any of the Q here, but I picked here the Q that was generated by this essentially noisy mechanism. I use Jensen inequality, and that gives me basically uh, something akin to the elbow. So I, when I recombine with the expectation of a X naught, where X naught is distributed according to the data distribution, I obtain the following elbow for essentially my generative model, my denoising diffusion model. Okay. So that's actually kind of uh, interesting. Okay. So we've seen that basically. Well, one way to to uh, to train uh, to train denoising diffusion model is to write an elbow for the denoising diffusion model. It's very similar again to VAE, except that instead of having one latent variable z, you have k of them, and they are of the same dimension as q naught at x naught, and you don't learn a, an encoder. It's fixed. Okay. So now let's look at this first function. So I don't want to spend too much time on that because I think we have more interesting things to do. But the important thing is that you can play with this elbow, okay? And for appropriate parameterization of the backward Markov transition density, P theta here, then what you're gonna obtain, you're gonna obtain that this negative elbow corresponds to actually the denoising loss function, denoising uh, score matching loss function I've written previously. So I'm gonna skip the detail, it's a bit technical, but the important bit is that basically you can, by using this very specific elbow, using this kind of fixed encoder, you recover the kind of loss function to try in the score network I was presenting before, okay? So that's, that's actually uh, an interesting perspective. Uh, on, I'll let you, if you, are, you can have a look at the slide and ask me a question if you're interested in that. Okay. Okay, now I want to move to, to this topic, which is, I think, extremely important. So 
at the end of the lecture of Xenia, someone asks, say, okay, if I want to generate only uh, digits with five, what do I do? Well, okay, so this is the topic of conditional simulation. Um, well, really, it's just Bayesian in terms. Okay. So, okay, so what I want to do, so same point as before. So you had access some, to some basically training data, okay, uh, from some distribution Q0. Um, but now what I want to do is I don't want to sample, obtain unconditional sample. I want basically to sample from a posterior distribution, okay. Um, basically, the posterior distribution is going to be proportional to the essentially think of it the data distribution times some likelihood term, okay? So here, basically, you maybe want to put on phases on generating digit that correspond to five, say. But you might be in a kind of inverse problem, actually an inverse problem setting, where basically Q0 denotes basically a, a prior distribution on natural images on Y is a kind of highly corrupted version of these images. Or you might be that Y basically corresponds to the original image, but with basically you have some missing parts. So essentially you want to do in painting on this kind of problem. Okay, so that's literally a very important obviously problem. And indeed, when you do this kind of, uh, you know, text to image system, where you can think of it that obviously it's also a problem of conditional simulation because you want to condition your simulation by the text prompt that was given to you. Okay. So you want to sample from this, this distribution, okay? And you want to do that using, again, this kind of denoising diffusion model. So how you, can you achieve that? Well, what I'm telling you is that one thing you should have understood now is that to obtain sample from this conditional distribution, this is a posterior distribution, the only thing you need, really, is to have access to an approximation to the score of this diffuse version of the posterior distribution. Okay, so when we were doing unconditional generation, I diffuse, I noise, if you want, the unconditional distribution using my noising mechanism, and then basically I obtain approximation of, of the scores of this noise version of the original distribution. And once I get that, I can do basically this backward simulation so as to obtain approximate sample. Here, it's gonna be exactly the same. So really, the only thing I need to do is to be able to come up with an approximation of the score of the diffuse posterior distribution. So now, here, I've replaced Q0 by the, obviously, posterior distribution of interest. Okay. So it's non-trivial. It's non-trivial because obviously the big difference between unconditional generation on unconditional generation is unconditional generation. I have access to sample from Q0, okay? But unconditional generation, uh, sorry, unconditional generation have access to sample from Q0. But conditional generation, obviously I don't have access to sample from this posterior. This is what I'm trying to solve. That's what I'm trying to achieve. So what are we gonna do? Okay, so we're gonna use the following identity. So it turns out that this, this quantity, you can compute the score. You have an expression for the score, which is given as follow. So the score of the diffuse posterior is the score of the diffuse prior, plus basically some kind of additional guidance term. Or the additional guidance term is basically a function of some kind of version of the int integrated original likelihood. So I'll give you a new expression here. Okay, so what you have here, so this thing is not the original likelihood term here. I have a, a little subscript xk. This quantity is given essentially, you see, this is the original likelihood that you integrate over the posterior distribution of x, uh, or the conditional distribution of x not given xk. Okay? Okay. So now if I can approximate these things, actually, then I can come up 
I use, I, I substitute this score instead of an unconditional score in my reverse simulation and I'm done. It's gonna, I'm gonna have approximate sample from the posterior distribution. So how do we approximate that? Well, assume you already have trained, you have access to a pre-trained model that does unconditional simulation, okay? So you download it on the, on the web, you have uh, open AI, uh, you know, against, uh, to, uh, you know, the model. So because it's an unconditional model, well, they give you basically access to an approximation to, the, to this quantity. So the only thing you have to do yourself for the likelihood you've been given, you need to approximate this expression. Okay. Well, it turned out there are various expressions that have been developed in the literature that works very well. So for example, is why is categorical. You can simply try a classifier so to approximate this likelihood term on you basically, you learn this classifier on kind of noise version of the original images. Another thing you can do is the following very simple thing. It's to say, well, okay, I'm gonna make a rough approximation. I'm gonna say that really this, this likelihood here, which relied on this intractable integral, I can just basically approximate it by the original likelihood, but basically where I substitute, I replace X naught by the denoiser expectation of X naught on XK. On the expectation of X naught given XK can be basically estimated using the unconditional model. Okay, so you can use that. And this thing turns out it works actually remarkably well for a lot of actually inverse problems. So there's a lot of paper that are using this type of approximation. But this thing is quite remarkable because it really tells you you can really take a pre trained model and you just need to design the approximation of this term so as to sample from the conditional distribution of interest. That's actually quite useful. Okay, that's one way to do it. It's known as guidance, or that's one of the kind of main features, the very interesting features of diffusion model. Forget that. Now, another thing you can do, basically, is instead of essentially using pre-trained model, what you could do is simply directly learn an approximation of this conditional score, okay? So remember the 2D formula I was having, the 2D formula was telling me that the, the, the intractable score was given by the conditional expectation or the gradient of the log condition, which is tractable with respect to the conditional distribution of X naught given XK. If you have an additional conditioning observation Y, well, I'm telling you that this is the expression you obtain. You can basically check it. The proof is completely similar to what I've presented be before. And it tells you here that basically, again, the gradient of the log of the diffuse posterior is nothing that the conditional expectation of the gradient of the log condition, which is tractable, and this expectation is respect to the conditional distribution of X naught given XK on the conditioning information Y. Okay? This is a conditional expectation. Whenever you have a conditional expectation, you can estimate it by minimizing a regression loss. Okay, so very similar to what we were doing in the unconditional scenario. So now, if you really want to basically learn the score the, by regression, the only thing you need to do is you need to have a function now, you have a, a neural net that is a function of basically the state variable on the conditioning observation Y, on you minimize this square loss here where the expectation now is not only with respect to X naught on XK, but with respect to sample for Y from the original likelihood, okay? So that's kind of really, you know, an alternative where you can basically directly learn the conditional score instead of learning an independent uh, guidance term. So again, maybe uh, the first time you see it, it seems a bit overly complicated, but this is the, the, what is actually magic about it is that essentially when you can do unconditional simulation, you can do conditional simulation by just modifying a few lines of code, which is quite remarkable, actually. Uh, for those of you who have worked before on Bayesian, in Ferrant, on MCMC, and so on, these kind of techniques don't tend to scale, whereas the method works very well even in very high dimension. So that's quite remarkable. There's a lot of trick after that that I won't discuss that you can use so as to improve actually empirical performance that people have noticed in the literature. Okay, so lesson, one lesson to learn 
very easy to go from unconditional to conditional simulation with this kind of diffusion model. Okay, that's nice. Okay, so this is application here. Uh, so this is text to image. Uh, basically, this is glide. So you see, this is uh, the prompt here. So in this case, the, the, the conditioning information is the following prompt. Okay, and they use the classifier for guidance. So the classifier for guidance is basically the technique where they learn directly the conditional score by regression. The second technique I presented. Okay, so those techniques are also widely used uh, in practice. Okay. Okay. So now, so we learn about this kind of diffusion model, the noise in diffusion model. Uh, so for those of you, uh, you know, who know diffusion. You know that for the timing, I have not presented any diffusion process. Everything I presented is some kind of simple discrete time Markov process. So why is it called diffusion? Okay, and uh, is it useful to uh, have some kind of a continuous time perspective, uh, basically on this type of algorithm? So my claim is that yes, it's actually quite useful. Okay, so we're going to move now from discrete time to continuous time and see that it actually brings some kind of, you know, some insight on some advantage uh, also to think about, about those techniques in continuous time. Okay, so for those of you who have read some, um, we've looked a bit at the noising diffusion model. They see, for example, in the paper of Song, the famous paper of Song, you have this kind of figure that appear where you have some kind of diffusion that moves forward on diffusion that is backward. And we see basically, oh, I can reconcile these kind of figures with what I presented before. Okay, so what is a diffusion? So this is going to be the shortest introduction to diffusion process uh, you can think of. So diffusion are continuous time stochastic process. Okay, and you can think of them as like it's like an ordinary differential equation. Okay, so forget about the second term here, dwt for the timing. So if you had just this term here, it would be simply an ordinary differential equation. But now what I'm going to do is I'm going to have some basically sigma dwt here. So this term is going to correspond to some kind of Brownian motion. So the Brownian motion is a continuous time stochastic process, which has independent increment. And if you integrate a multivariate Brownian motion over the time interval of length delta, then basically its increment are Gaussian of mean zero on variance delta times identity. Okay, so you can think of it when I write dWt, it's some kind, some uh, infinitesimal, you know, uh, increment of Gaussian noise. Okay, so that, that's really what it is. Okay, but really, at the end of the day, just the ordinary differential equation plus a bit of Gaussian noise that is added to it, actually. Okay, so here is for the shortest introduction to diffusion process you can think of. Okay, so now let's consider very simple diffusion. So I'm going to consider a diffusion, which is linear diffusion that is in the drift here. Ftxt is given simply by minus gamma xt. Okay, and I basically add a bit of noise, Gaussian noise here, actually. Okay, so if you didn't have this term here, if you forget about it for the time being, and if you were initializing your diffusion at a point x naught, then you know that xt would be essentially x naught exponential minus gamma t. Okay, it's very simple. The standard trivial linear differential equation. Okay, now we're not doing that. We're adding some noise. Okay, so we're adding some noise. And my claim here is that this thing, if you run it long enough, whatever being the initial distribution, it gives you basically converge toward a Gaussian distribution. So this thing is known as an einstein lenbeck process in the probability literature. In this diffusion literature in machine learning, they call it variance preserving process. Um, it's simply an ODE, whatever being the initial point, you run it long enough, essentially X, XT gonna, its law gonna converge toward the standard multivariate normal. And for those of you who are familiar with Langevin algorithm, or this kind of Langevin diffusion, this thing is nothing but a Langevin diffusion that targets a multivariate normal distribution, okay? Okay. You take this diffusion, it's a continuous time process, run it over an interval of time capital T, okay? And now, basically, I'm gonna look at the, I'm gonna discretize the time 
this time interval t in k bins. Okay, so I'm going to look at basically interval zero, delta, two delta, and so on and so forth, till time basically t. So that basically, on basically my discretization is such that t is equal to k delta. Okay, so I look at that. Um, my question is what is the recursion satisfied by the, dis the, the value? of the, the, the discretized diffusion at time zero, delta, two delta, till x, till t. Well, tell you that by integrating this linear Gaussian differential equation, stochastic differential equation, you can see this is given by that, okay? So this thing is exactly what I was using before and for as a noising mechanism. So really the way we did it, we started from this process here, okay, and we say, well, okay, I'm going to use beta very, very close to uh, to uh, to zero. But really, what it is is just you can think of it as just discretizing this kind of stochastic differential equation. That's a simple discretization of this equation. Okay, now, what is the time reversal of this process? So this is a diffusion here, okay. Well, if you look, yeah. If you look at the process of the diffusion, you look at it forward, it's a diffusion, but what I'm, the claim is that if you look at this diffusion backward in time, you start from time capital T, and you look at it in the reverse time direction, okay, then it turns out the process is also a diffusion. Okay. And this diffusion satisfies the following stochastic differential equation. So in this notation, here, this WT bar is a Brownian motion where you look backward in time, and DT is a negative, basically, incremental, uh, sorry, a negative time increment, okay? So you have this expression here, and it should remind you something, because really, the generative model with the, the kind of approximation we came up with of this kind of, uh, of, the, of the discrete time reversal is that. And you see that really what we've been doing by doing all our Taylor approximation and so on, we were just basically performing a discrete time approximation of this time reversal. Okay, so that's it's actually neater to do things in discrete time, in continuous time. When you think of things in continuous time, it turns out also that it's much, much simpler to write the evidence law bond. Like, so I'm not going to spare you the detail. You can look at the slide if you want, but everything becomes much, much simpler, actually. Uh, in particular, you have an evidence law bond that can be written in like, you know, one single line, whereas if you look in discrete time, the slide is covered of equation. It's a nightmare. It's pretty ugly. Okay. So much nicer. Okay. So now, why, I just say, so just to skip that. Why, why is it interesting? Is it interesting only because the maths are nicer? My claim is not. Because the turns out that you can leverage all the kind of literature on numerics, apply probability, and so on, to come up with numerical scheme, actually, that are basically discretized the SD in a kind of, in a much better, much better way. So you obtain an algorithm that works actually better. Okay, so it's really much nicer to think in continuous time and then discretizing than basically uh, looking at uh, uh, discrete time directly. The second thing is that if you understand discrete time, uh, continuous time, you can come up also with new scheme so as to perform sampling. Okay. So in particular, I'm not going to have time to elaborate, but it turns out that you don't need stochastic differential equation to do generation. You can generate everything for a simple deterministic actually a uh, mechanism which corresponds to a time discretization of an ordinary differential equation. So this whole SD thing might not be actually already necessary. Okay, so we don't have time to elaborate, so I will jump. Okay, want to conclude by a few things. So everything I presented here was to do basically, you have data in RD, and basically you just use your diffusion in RD, you time do the time reversal, uh, on here it is. But in many, many cases, your data don't lie on RD. So it might be that basically 
they lie on a Riemannian manifold, okay? Or uh, basically you have to deal with discrete data, or you have data that lives on the simplex, or you're interested in functions. Okay? It turns out that you can extend all this mechanism, all this machinery extend quite gracefully to all this kind of scenario. So it's actually quite neat that you know all this thing can be extended to very, very general, uh, very, very general uh, setup. So in particular, uh, this kind of work on Riemannian manifold has been used actually to generate new proteins by the Watson of Baker lab. Um, it's, I think it's gonna be the cover of nature very soon actually. So it's kind of a nice application. We skip that. So just to wrap up, this kind of denoising diffusion model actually are quite elegant on the provide state of the art performance in numerous domain, okay? except text generation. That's a big, big domain where it doesn't work that well. So it's an open problem to, solve, uh, to, to do that. There's been recent advances that are discussed in my lab we haven't time to, to, to cover, which is that literally, it might be that really you don't need this kind of diffusion type ideas, but you can do everything with ordinary differential equation. So there's a variety of algorithms that have been proposed uh, recently, such as flow matching, on rectified flow or stochastic interpolant, which are an alternative to denoising diffusion model, which appear very promising. There's a wealth of theoretical results which are available for this model because they have a very neat mathematical structure, but none of them explain the remarkable empirical performance of denoising diffusion model. In particular, none of them really actually capture the fact that those models work only well, for example, if the, the network you use to learn the score is a unit. Okay, so all the, the theoretical results are kind of apply probability, you know, type result, but don't explain what's going on really, why those things work so well. Anyway, there's an exciting research area on, uh, you know, I think, you know, there's a lot of interesting open question and uh, I encourage you to, to work on the topic. Thanks. <laughs>